Welcome in. It may be one of the most important conversations we have ever had on this radio show in six years. And it's coming up in an hour and a half on KCMO Talk Radio. So as you get your morning started here with us, just know that you want to be here at 730 when the wife of Eric DeVolcanaire, who just had his prison sentence upheld in the shooting of Cameron Lamb back in 2019, his wife, Sarah, is going to be joining us in the studios here at KCMO Talk Radio from 7.30 to 8 o'clock uh, this morning. And this is going to be a great conversation, an important conversation. She has not spoken to media now for the better part of four years, assuming that the justice system would do its job. It did not time after time after time, and now she understandably so feels the need to correct some things the media has conveniently left out of her husband's story because in large part they were looking to fit a narrative. And that narrative they were looking to fit is white cop shoots black man, cops bad, law enforcement bad. That's the narrative. And when you get in those kind of racial components in the media's eyes, I mean, that is absolutely something that they promote they push it's why poll after poll after poll shows that the american people have no idea how many unarmed individuals actually end up getting shot by police every year now cameron lamb that was not the case but i'm just saying in general the media promotes stories and pumps up stories that fit their preferred narrative and unfortunately this cameron lamb story from four years ago in kansas city was case in point of that But um, she is wanting to speak out. She is coming here first on KCMO Talk Radio to have that conversation. And uh, we are grateful for that. And we know that you will be here at 730 this morning. So uh, start telling friends, family around town that this conversation is going to be taking place in an hour and a half and that you're not going to want to miss it because something tells me uh, this will be This conversation will be the biggest news story in Kansas City today. So hope your Tuesday's off to a great start. Of course, it's Tirade Tuesday as well. That's going to be happening at 8.30 this morning on KCMO. That being said, back to yesterday, the big news story of the day yesterday nationally was the fact that we had a press secretary for the White House who was asked, hey, you know, how concerned are you guys about the fact that we've got anti-Semitism rampantly out in the open in major American cities, on college campuses, protests happening, letters being signed. Is that something that bothers you? You know, what do you think about that? And what was the answer from the White House yesterday in one of the most fumbled, bumbled answers you're ever going to hear? Well, hey, yeah, uh, don't forget about the Muslims. Huh? We asked you a question about anti-Semitism. Can you give me an answer about that? Please, Karine Jean-Pierre, here we go. In one of her worst answers in her tenure as White House press secretary since taking over for Jen Psaki. And by the way, being one of Karine Jean-Pierre's worst answers, that's impressive. That's hard to do. Level of concern right now about the potential rise of anti-Semitism in light of everything that's going on in Israel. So a couple of things. Um, Look, um, Uh, We have not seen uh, any credible uh, threats. I know there's been always questions about uh, credible threats. uh, And so I just want to make sure that that's out there. But look, uh, Muslim and those. How how do we define credible, by the way? I'm just curious. I mean, I've seen a lot of rampant anti-Semitism around the country the last two weeks out in the open. I, I, I don't know what a credible threat is. I understand, you know, words are words and you have free speech in this country. I'm just curious how we would define that. But anyway, let's continue. Perceived uh, to be Muslim have endured a disproportionate uh, number of hate fueled attacks. Uh, and certainly President huh? Biden understands that many of our Muslim Arab 
Arab, Arab Americans and Palestinian American loved ones and neighbors are worried about the hate being directed at their communities. And that is something you heard the president speak to in his, uh, in his address uh, just last, last Thursday. And so uh, one of the things that the president has done is directed his team, uh, uh, Homeland Security team, to prioritize prevention uh, and disruption of any emerging threats that could harm the Jewish, the Muslim, uh, Arab Americans, or, or any other communities. And that is something that the president has sought to do and, and since day one. As you know, what? the president ran on, on, um, on you know, bringing commu protecting communities, obviously, but bringing people together, the soul, uh, uh, protecting the soul of the nation. Uh, and so um, that is something that the president takes very, very seriously. Oh. Uh, and um, you know, we're going to continue to denounce any sort of hate uh, towards any American here. Uh, and so that's what we're going to continue to be steadfast on. Again, he has he has uh, uh, advised, directed his Homeland Security uh, team to make sure that they're on top of this. Oh, my goodness gracious. The question was about anti-Semitism. And I got a minute on anti-Muslim rhetoric, which, yeah, is wrong, too. But once again, that wasn't the question. It's like when I ask my four year old, did you clean your room? Dad, Dad, I got to go to the bathroom. No, answer the question. Did you clean your room? That's all I asked. Did you clean up your toys? I don't want to know about anything else right now. I got one question. What do you have to say about the rise in anti-Semitism that is on full-blown display in this country? Can't get an answer. Can't, you got to admit it on, uh, you know, anti-Muslim rhetoric. That's what you got out of that. I, you know, we, we, two and a half weeks ago, the world witnessed the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Anti-Semitic incidents are up all over the country. I mean, I know Jewish people who are afraid to send their kids to school right now. And you got these people talking about Islamophobia. I mean, they are, they are loving the idea of talking about Islamophobia. They want to talk about Islamophobia. Anti-Semitism? Eh, yeah, you know, I mean, come on. Islamophobia is out there, you know. Have we wow. had any credible threats? Yeah. Islam, you know? Yeah, seriously. Actually, if you've espoused a conservative viewpoint on social media, you yeah. are a credible threat. True, true. Check that box off. You are a credible threat. I, this is, you know, I, I remember a time... When if you said things like all lives matter, you were called a bigot. Remember that, right? It was like, you can't say that. It's black lives matter. We're talking about black lives. This isn't about all lives matter. This is in many ways far worse than all lives matter. Far worse. What you've seen is people targeted simply because they are Jews. That's what you saw, of course, in Israel two and a half weeks ago. 1,400 people slaughtered. And that's what you are seeing all over the country today on college campuses and in major American cities. Whether it's here in Kansas City, where we saw some of those protests two weekends ago now, right? Right down on the plaza, we saw that firsthand. The media did an awful job sympathizing with those groups, sad to say, but also very much par for the course. And now you're seeing it, of course, on college campuses. UMKC had its big uh, pro-Palestine event last week. So it's happening here, just like it's happening all over the country. And if you ask the White House about that, what do they say? Whoa, I, we got to nip this Islamophobia in the bud here real fast, guys. As I heard Corinne Jean-Pierre answering that question, too, I wanted to stop her and just say, sir, this is a Wendy's, the old meme. Because she is totally out in left field instead of talking about the issues that real America is thinking about right now. And that is a clear rise. They see it on TV. They see it on social media. You read about it. If you follow your local news, your national news. And that is, once again, a push against the Jewish people and a lot of talk. A lot of talk about Islamophobia. 913-408-7957. I know you're seeing this as well right here in Kansas City as we get it rolling on a Tuesday morning. 913-408-7957. But the uh, boneheaded takes, the boneheaded approach to start 
The second week of this global crisis did not get any better from there. I'll explain that coming up next. You know, you would think, too, that um, with what we're seeing on college campuses over the last couple of weeks or so, and that has caught many people off guard. You know, many of us who have been like, hey, college is not really what it used to be. It's become an indoctrination center. It's become a way to mold minds into voting for a singular party in this country. It's sad. I don't think any of us are happy about that, that college has become that, but that's what it's become. But a lot of people had their heads buried in the sand, and they're like, oh, not my alma mater, right? But now you're seeing some of the most prominent donors for some of the most prominent universities in the country say, you know, um, I'm done. I'm not giving to Harvard, Yale, Penn. We've seen that, and we've talked about that on the show over the last week. Some of the biggest donors to these Ivy League institutions are pulling the plug. Some of them because they're Jewish, some of them because, well, they just realize and they've opened their eyes up to what's actually happening on their campuses that they have given millions and millions of dollars to. So this is uh, not good for those who have been riding the gravy train of higher education, those in government who have been um, more than willing to try to do things like bail out student loans because they want more kids to go to college because they know If they can get them in the college, if they can get them indoctrinated, even if they come out and they have no discernible skills that apply to the labor force, then they can do quasi promises of student loan bailouts. Once again, look like the good guys. And if they can't get it done, they say, ah, you know, just keep voting for us and we'll eventually help you eliminate your student loan debt. You see how the game is played? So all these videos and articles about how college campuses, some of the most prominent in the country, have been rampant and dripping with anti-Semitism over the last couple of weeks, has not been good for that cabal. So when Karine Jean-Pierre got asked about that yesterday, the White House press secretary, well, you know, she tried to dodge this one as best she could. Does the president view anti-Israel protests and sentiment on college campuses as anti-Semitism? So look, I'm not going to get into what's happening across the country and at different universities. I'm not going to get into the specifics. As the admiral said, the First Amendment right, right? That's what something, a peaceful protest is really uh, part, of, part of our democracy, being able for folks to, to, uh, to be able. They are big fans of peaceful protests as long as you don't have a red hat on, you know. Don't put one of those on your head and then peaceful protest all you want. But I love the question right out of the gates. Well, you know, what do you think of these um, anti-Semitic rallies taking place? Well, you know, I mean, free speech, right? Right? Wink, wink, nod, nod. Come on. Able to express their feelings. I'm not going to get into any, uh, uh, you know, specifics on that. The president has been very clear in wanting to make sure that uh, Jewish Americans wanting to make sure that our Americans, Muslims, are protected here. That is what he believes in, that we they have the right uh, to live their lives and to feel protection and to feel like they're able to be part of a community. You got something for me. You got you got something good for me, John. Before I continue, I'm not going to get into this. Oh, (laughs) as press secretary, you don't need to even say that. That's the good part about being a good speaker. Listen to Quentin Lucas. He would be a great press secretary. (laughs) He's what, he was agent now? Well, no, I'm just saying, <laughs> Lucas never says, I'm not going to answer your question. And then yeah, go on to no. babble for a minute. <laughs> no, there's a way to do that. And she just, she's all the time not answering that. I'm not going to get into it. I'm not getting yeah. into the specifics. The president has been clear. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Trust me. Anything but. If there's one thing this guy isn't, it's clear. All right. All right. I mean, goodness gracious. Come on, man. Jeez. What are we talking about? All right. Let's continue with uh, whatever this is. On denouncing any type of violence. And so uh, as it relates to peaceful protesting, people have the right to do that. Uh, but we're just not going to get into blow by blows of what's going on across the country. Well, the president has been very clear, not very clear blow by blow. But the president himself said silence is complicity. So if there's anti-Semitic letters being sent by students, or protests, sentiment, at of course, protests. Of course the president doesn't, uh, is, is, uh, 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 is against anti-Semitism. Of course. This is a president uh, that you have heard me say is prote- wants to protect communities. Okay, good. So why can't he stand up against the rhetoric coming off of college campuses? 
Once again, yes, you have a First Amendment right to say what you want in this country. I'm, no one's talking about taking that away. But why can't you stand forcefully against what is happening on the college campuses? That's the question. That's it. Remember, let's go back to the question. Does the president view anti-Israel protests and sentiment on college campuses as anti-Semitism? Well, first off, the obvious answer there is yes. Anti-Semitic rallies and protests are anti-Semitism. She should say forcefully, yes. Yes, they are anti-Semitic. And while you have a First Amendment right in this country... We vehemently oppose those protesters. You see, they're trying to play footsie with these people who are 98 percent of them are coming from uber progressive circles. That's been an awakening, as Jake Tapper has noted over the last couple of weeks. He's done a very good job on this at CNN and others as well. They have been surprised by the level of anti-Semitism coming out of the most progressive circles in this country. This was Jake Tapper two weeks ago. This does, these last few days have been a real uh, eye-opening period for a lot of people, a lot of Democrats, a lot of progressives, in terms of anti-Semitism on the left. A lot of people who seem more shocked at dehumanizing language uh, used by world leaders to describe Hamas than what Hamas actually perpetrated on Saturday. I don't give Jake Tapper credit much, but he nailed that. And Corinne Jean-Pierre in the White House at large is not willing to speak forcefully out against those who are sympathizing with Hamas. They will speak more loudly and more vehemently out against MAGA, MUGA, MIGA, MAGA, Trump than they will people who are finding sympathy in those who just slaughtered 1,400 innocent Jews because of nothing more than their religious beliefs. You know, it's funny. I, I, I know that many of you don't care and you're exhausted with Taylor Swift. But I, I'm i intrigued what kind of food they eat as much as anything else. Like, I'm just, you know, I like to know what kind of food people are into and where they're eating from. And, you know, we found out Sunday night from the Daily Mail that uh, Kelsey had Jack Stack catering his after party at his mansion there up north and then we found out that uh they had first watch delivered to the house on sunday morning for taylor before the game she got a turkey omelet from first watch which outstanding choice by the way i mean two great choices some of you knocking jack stack i mean you gotta get your taste buds checked i'll tell you i mean that's ridiculous you probably also are big fans of the uh, filet of fish if you think Jack Stack is bad barbecue, gosh, I mean, what is that all about? And they have some of the best sides. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I will say this. I've probably had Jack Stack, I mean, many, many, many times, obviously. One time I was underwhelmed, and it was when I got the ribs. That was the only time I've been underwhelmed by Jack Stack. But I like, you know, their burnt ends are they're huge burnt ends. I mean, they are just Big stacks of burnt ends. The sides, the sides are amazing. Mark's right about that. The beans you can't beat. So they do outstanding work. I don't know what that's all about. Some of you Jack Stack haters on my Facebook page, I can't quite understand. But anyway, Daily Mail, I guess they've got people just hanging out in Kansas City. <laughs> Paparazzi all over the place, it seems. On his street. <laughs> on his street, literally, until he moves uh, to his uh, security... I can, can you believe that, by the way? Travis Kelsey has been in a neighborhood for several years in Kansas City where anyone can just drive up to his front door. There's no gate. And, yeah, I mean, nobody bothers him yeah, until uh, now. That's the beauty of Kansas City, Yeah, right? You can just be Travis Kelsey, be the second biggest star in this town, live in a regular neighborhood, and the only thing that blows it up for you is, well, dating literally the biggest pop star on the planet. This generation's... Michael Jackson, Beatles, uh, you know, I mean, Taylor Swift is, right? Mark, you'd say she's in that stratosphere. Oh, yeah. She broke some record yesterday with, like, another top single. Wow. I didn't see that. Yeah. Well, I'm too busy trying to find out what she's eating here in Kansas City. (laughs) So, anyway, uh, Daily Mail had paparazzi camped outside his house. And they followed, I don't know who this guy is, handler, delivery boy, whatever, sidekick. And um, we found out that Taylor and Travis had Barrio Mexican brought back home. 
That was their uh, lunch yesterday. Picking up barbecue burnt ends quesadillas and chips and salsa. They even got the order down. I don't know how they figured out the order. I don't know if they went into the restaurant after this guy walks out with the order, but they have these pictures on the Daily Mail of the guy who is Kelsey's handler going to and from Barrio, picking up the Mexican food. And this is up north, by the way. I know they have locations all over town. They got one in Brookside. Uh, They got a Red Bridge location. This is at the uh, Briarcliff location. Oh, I've been to the one right on 31st Street now that I'm looking at it. I've been to that one um, right there on 31st Street when I was living downtown my first year. We went there with my in-laws, I believe it was. We were just kind of walking around the area and stumbled upon Barrio. That's right. Okay, They do a great job with their tacos. Now I'm knowing. It's been a while since I've been here, but now I'm knowing this spot. And I know John's a huge fan of uh, Barrio Mexican. So I've been to the location Mm -hmm. at 31st Street, John. You're a big fan of the Red Bridge location. Red Bridge, yeah. Get music out there and stuff. Yeah. Sometimes they open up the whole deal. Well, Kelsey getting that delivered to the house yesterday. By the way, this Mm. blows up the, I guess in hindsight, it's a misperception I have about these world-class athletes that they're eating eggs and chicken and, uh, you know, (laughs) salads all day. Guy's got Jack Stack catered to the house last night. Now he's tanking down some barbecue burnt ends quesadillas. I mean, that's living large. I like it. But, you know, I thought that these guys would be on a little tighter the kid um, out of Cleveland, diet. Man, you can't take the Cleveland out of the kid. Maybe that's it. That's kind of where I'm at. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. You see the guys and they're like, I just eat fish and raw eggs. And, yeah. You know, other guys are like, hey, how much ribs you got there? <laughs> yeah. You know, they're ready for Zarda at training camp. <laughs> Remember, um, I think it was Tom Brady once his his diet was released. And, I mean, the guy, I don't know how he's still alive eating I mean, it's healthy for him, but the guy was eating just stuff that after a week, you'd be like, give me a hamburger, give me a hamburger. <laughs> I wasn't eating hey, red remember, meat. Remember, there's a John Joan Cusack movie, you know, his sister's, and then she's bitching at him. She goes, there's no food in your food. <laughs> <laughs> well, Travis Kelsey does not have that problem. Dude's eating Jack Stack last night. Then he doubles down on the barbecue today. Him and Taylor getting burnt end quesadillas from Barrio. Well, that's after Succotash's French Toast. I don't know if you've seen that. People Magazine had that article. I did So see. that was coming up. So, I mean, let's just do, uh, what, lunch, dinner, and breakfast with Travis. Yeah. We'll have a show. <laughs> what, what are we having today? I don't know. It sounds pretty damn good, though. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that yeah. right now. Here I thought the only thing holding me back from being in the NFL was my diet. Apparently that's not the case. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. He is. And maybe I'm a little closer than I thought. Yeah, you are closer than we thought, John. <laughs> You know, maybe Chris Jones is taking advantage of the two-for-one Big Mac Mondays when he gets the sack on Sundays during Chiefs season. Jeez, you're not the only guy taking advantage of that. Can you imagine going in to claim it? A little something for the effort here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hysterical. Uh, sir, you still got to buy one of them. I got to buy one? Wait, wait, wait. What? Wait, wait. something for the effort. Everyone's got, everyone else is getting a free Big Mac. Jeez. That's funny. <laughs> so Daily Mail, uh, you know, Quentin Lucas, by the way, should be thanking Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey for this relationship. How many sales tax dollars has this city generated from paparazzi hanging out in Kansas City, specifically in Travis Kelsey's neighborhood just north of the river, at least until he moves out south? Because he's going to be in Johnson County. So Quentin Lucas better enjoy this while it lasts. Because soon those sales tax dollars are going to be going to Johnson County because of where he's moving in Leewood, which is not a secret. Kansas City Business Journal had it last week. You can look it up for yourself. It is a secluded neighborhood in Leewood, and it's beautiful, man. Six beds, seven baths, but I'm still concerned about how he's going to get to and from the pool to the barbecue because there is a big walk up and down those stairs. <laughs> Need a streetcar line there or something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't give Johnson County any ideas. Mike, Mike Kelly's going to like that, by the way, so please don't do that. 824 on a uh, Tuesday morning. Rain is falling across Kansas City. We appreciate you being here on KCMO Talk Radio, now on FM at 95.7. So it's been a... Uh, Emotional, powerful hour that we've had here on KCMO. Talking last hour to Sarah DeValconair, the wife of Eric DeValconair, who just had his prison sentence upheld. Um, She was in the studio for a half hour. If you missed it, that'll be up on the podcast after the show. And then um, Al, the father of Eric, also just happened to call in on a a whim here 
for the last segment, and he spent his life in law enforcement, so he's clearing up some things as well. So I, I thought the most, I mean, he said a lot of really important things here, but it is so true when Al DeVolcanaire brings up the fact that this prosecutor in Jackson County, Gene Peters Baker, is obviously soft on crime by every definition. And, you know, you can always find an excuse for prosecutors on why they don't go after criminals or why they don't pursue cases. Well, you know, uh, we got unreliable witnesses. And that's the phrase that I wrote down here from Al. How many times, and just ask anybody in law enforcement in this community, how many times that office has bailed on a case because of supposed unreliable witnesses? And then think about what we are experiencing here and going through when it comes to wildly unreliable witnesses in this Eric DeVolcanaire prosecution and case. Suddenly, unreliable is just kind of uh, in the eye of the beholder, right? If the witness fits the narrative that you would like to achieve and the prosecution that you would like a slap on the back for at a boy, at a girl, well, suddenly they're not so unreliable, are they? Suddenly, you know, you can convince yourself in your own mind that eh, they're reliable enough. And that is as disturbing as anything else here in this story. Some of you have asked about the judges. Listen, I'm not here to go after any judges unelected judges all i'll say is that they are judges involved who have been appointed by this governor mike parson now you can't get them all right right ask any governor can't get them all right but the governor does have a chance to right the wrongs here of his own judges i don't know if that makes it easier i don't know if that makes it harder i have no idea But they are his judges. And uh, to me, if I'm the governor and you hear the interview with Sarah and you hear Al and you dive into this case, I don't know how you could possibly sleep at night at this point not giving a pardon to somebody who had an unblemished track record with KCPD for decades. Story after story, I mean, you know, you got the detective's wife here. Um, God bless her. She is strong as hell, huh? On the verge of tears, sharing some of these stories at the end of the conversation. You have the facts all laid out, the most important being around the gun, right? The, 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 the narratives that were pushed around the gun and Cameron Lamb, inability to use the left hand, all these different things. Uh, that were just outright lies. I don't, and, and you know, Mike Parson, he's come on this show many times. Um, Want to have him on many times again. We've had these conversations with him. Not on this issue, but many conversations around law enforcement. He's a former sheriff, supportive law enforcement, back the blue, the whole thing. Well, this will be his biggest test yet on how much and whether or not he truly backs the blue. It's one thing to have the bumper stickers and hold the signs up and, you know, chant the rallying cries and all that. But when you have justice that has clearly not been served based on the available information, well, I don't know what more you need. So the governor's office, you can call. You can ask him to pardon Eric DeVolcanair at 573 751-3222. It's 573-751-3222. We're going to reach out to the governor's office today. We are going to get them a copy of that interview. And if they're going to say no, we're going to make them say no. With all the available information out there. But something tells me that, you know, we can change the narrative. The only memorable thing, I haven't even touched on this yet today. It's been such a busy morning. Uh, The only memorable thing that came out of The president's speech yesterday he gave on Bidenomics. Take a listen to this. Eight seconds. See, I apologize. I have to go to the situation with another issue that I have to deal with. But thank you, thank you, thank you. 
So he bails on the Bidenomics speech early, which is kind of how the American people feel dealing with Bidenomics. Um, but he says he's got to go to the Situation Room. Something came up. Do you think the Situation Room is code for uh, the bathroom? <laughs> Reminded of the old uh, marketing ploy of yeah. where will you be when your laxative starts working? <laughs> Gosh, I mean, it's just like mid-speech. Uh, uh, whoa, I, I got to go. I, I, uh, oh, oh, I apologize. I have to go to the situation with another issue that I have to deal with. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. What did he have? Another situation to deal Wait, with? Or, situ- he had uh, something? Uh, uh, I couldn't make out that part. I'm, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm late. I had to go to the situation room. I apologize. I have to go to the situation room with another issue. I have to deal with. Another, oh, another issue. issue. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank there was you. another issue, all right. Yeah. There was definitely another issue. Um, should we call it, instead of the situation room, the something else you ate in room? The... <laughs> <laughs> I'll take an H, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> Can we add an H to that one instead of the situation room? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, that is Bidenomics in a nutshell, though. Just a big wet one in the situation room. That's the <laughs> that's what the economic policies are. That's Bidenomics in a nutshell. Let me. Oh, gosh. Before I, thank gosh, there's only four minutes left in this show. president has been clear from day one. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I decided that I was going to uh, bring this up at the end of the show. I figured I would get myself into as little trouble as possible uh, bringing it up now. So, <laughs> oh, my gosh. The memes are going wild, by the way. <laughs> so, someone goes, that's code for I just poop my pants. I mean, t- t- <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother, if I don't laugh, I'm going to cry, by the way. So there you go. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, on a much, <laughs> it just seems silly. It's kind of one of those things where yeah, I was dealing with some war stuff in the war room over there. <laughs> we were talking war stuff. <laughs> it didn't even need to be said. Sorry, I'm late. Here I am. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly the situation right. room, important stuff only I can handle. <laughs> uh, diaper change, I won! Oh, gosh. Okay. Anyway, um, on a serious note, I want to share the number with you one more time. And I'm going to share it with you, by the way, all week. But this morning, if you missed it, it's going to be up on the podcast. I would argue it was um, a top three conversation we've ever had on this show in almost six years. Sarah DeVolcanaire, she is uh, the wife of Eric DeVolcanaire, the KCPD detective who shot and killed Cameron Lamb back in 2019. His prison sentence was upheld last week, and it's becoming more clear by the day as the facts continue to come out on this case that justice was not served. She laid it out beautifully as a spouse who is right now grieving the fact that they have three children. Um, Eric is now going to prison unless Governor Parson pardons him. And she is asking everybody to call the governor's office to pardon Eric. And that number will be on our social media pages after the show. But I will share it with you here, 573-751-3222. All you have to do is be a Missouri resident and give your zip code. And that's the biggest thing they're looking for right now. Many of you have asked about donating um, to their, you know, obviously mounting bills and living expenses, which is something that we will also talk about. But the biggest thing right now is to try to get that pardon. And I hope that Governor Parson does the right thing. We will be reaching out to his office today after uh, the show wraps up and trying to figure out where exactly they're at on this thing. But the governor is a former sheriff himself. And if he were to look at the facts in this case and look at the timeline and everything else, the unreliability of the witnesses that is clear as day, unless you're Gene Peters Baker, the Jackson County prosecutor, uh, there is a lot that is going to make you say a man who is not supposed to be in prison is sadly in prison. And that's what you'll learn when you listen back to that conversation as well. 
So as always, everything you know we do on the interview side gets posted on the podcast. Same with the Ray Stevens show, by the way. They are, Mark's taking care of all that. So everything Ray does is going to be up on the podcast. So just search Pete Mundo on KCMO. Search Ray Stevens. You'll find the podcast of the show. Subscribe to it so you never miss a segment of the show. And, of course, another great way to listen is on the KCMO Talk Radio app. Download that today. So uh, we're going to have a great day tomorrow. We'll do the gender reveal at 830 here on KCMO Talk Radio. So set your alarms for that. And uh, you've got two awesome hours with Ray Stevens, followed by Dan Bongino on KCMO Talk Radio. And, uh, Mark, what do you guys have coming up off the top there? Yeah, we got Mark Alford to give us the latest on the speaker. It looks like they're down another person now. Uh, what so are they got? Eight, six, uh, I think. Six? Are they down to six? So we'll see. Six, seven, eight. Who's on first? Who's on second? What a joke. <laughs> what an absolute joke. What's the old? It's like football. You got three quarterbacks. You got no quarterbacks. You got six speakers. You got none. You got a great host coming up, Ray Stevens. We'll see you tomorrow.